Okay. Right. So, so, so thanks everyone for attending and, and thanks especially to, to, um, to our panelists who I'll introduce you to in a moment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with, with a uh, uh, screen sharing a PowerPoint introduction that allows me to introduce the session, but also introduce the three of them. And then we'll open it up to each of them to give a brief presentation before we go to questions and discussions with the audience. And, and, and we expect this to be a rather dynamic and, and engaging discussion. So, so, you know, Get your comments and questions ready. So, right. So when we were putting together this session, we were having a few discussions. One of the first things we thought was, what is the great debate? Um, and obviously this is a series that EGU runs every year around the great debate. So that's where the name comes from. But one thing that we're quite keen on conveying is that um, we're not going to debate whether or not there is discrimination in our discipline. Um, and we are not gonna debate um, our obligation as, as members of this community, um, nor as organizations, whether or not we have a role um, to play in addressing that. We do, we, we have a responsibility and we are gonna take that as read going forward. We also discussed where we sit in the conversation. I think we all agreed that this is not meant to be the start of the conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. Racism and sexism across society, including the geosciences, is a conversation that's been happening for a while, but we've not engaged with it with the, the vigor and commitment that we should have. So we view this less as the start of a conversation, but as a, as a catching up and engaging with an ongoing conversation and an accelerant to, to action. Now, in light of that, we've all hopefully empowered and encouraged our panelists and you as the audience to be as challenging and as provocative as they, as, as they can be. And in particular, um, you know, Helen but representing EGU as the president of EGU is symbolically convening the session in order to, to bring the weight of EGU around um, a sense of, that, that we need to have a, a, a very bold conversation. We need to push ourselves quite hard. And that's to, you know, we want to empower our participants and we want to empower all of you to think that way. So going through our participants, we're very, very lucky to have three panelists. I, I, I'm going to call them panelists. All of us are participants in this, including all of you. But our three panelists are absolutely fantastic, and they've been quite inspiring scientifically and in their leadership in this area. So Professor Chris Jackson is a professor of sustainable resources at the University of Manchester, and his research focuses on determining the structural and stratigraphic evolution of sedimentary basins. Liz Scowlant is a postdoc in the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge, but she's in a period of transition in her life. She's transitioning to a new role as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Um, and right now she's actually zooming to this meeting from Hawaii. So thanks for joining us at, at deep in the, the evening. Liz's research focused on improving lava flow forecasting techniques by integrating field studies, near surface geophysics and community outreach with numerical modeling. And our third panelist is Professor Jane Willenbring. I've known Jane for a while. Um, Jane is a geologist who solves problems related to geomorphology, eco-geomorphology, and environmental justice. And in particular, she uses cosmogenic nuclides and other techniques. Now, if you've been reading the slides as I've clicked through, you'll see that all of our panelists are, are what I would call somewhat reluctant EDI champions. They embarked on their careers because they love science. And as such, they might give us some advice but I think also they're going to make some, you know, they're going to share their experiences and they're going to challenge us and they're going to make demands of the rest of us. And again, that's why we put together some of the supporting people around this that we have. Um, you know, I, I anticipate them to challenge Helen as president of EGU, to challenge Claudia um, as a funder, to challenge me as sort of a symbolic representative of, of institutions. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a head of a department. So, what is our obligation, our responsibility to act? And we're not just going to look to them to tell us the way. We're going to, we're going to have to in, engage and interact and respond ourselves. And finally, I expect them to challenge all of you in the audience to ask the question about what you're going to do. So throughout the session, you can see that the Q&A is open. That is for questions. Fire in the questions. From that, I'm going to try to curate a bit of a discussion with them. But also, put in your own thoughts. What should EGU be doing to make a difference? What do you commit to do to make a difference? And from that, we might also pick up on different strands of the conversation. All right, that's more than enough from me. I'm now going to pass it over to the panelists, starting with Chris. Right, okay, over to you, Chris. Well, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, EGU, to come and uh, talk today. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege, but slightly terrifying to talk about something 
which like Rich alluded to, I don't really know much about, okay? So, you know, my five minute introduction comes with a, a generous a warning, and that is that I am a geo, not a Jedi, right? So this is a point I think all of the speakers will allude to, and Rich has already picked up on, is the fact that we are reluctantly being forced into things that we are not particularly trained in, and we have no desire to have experienced, nor do we have a desire to see some of the things we're going to cover in the next hour and a half occur in the future to the future generations of geoscientists. But it's our job, or at least we've had the willingness in our careers and the ability to engage in this and try to shape a better future. What I can talk about though, although I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist and I have no um, formal training in race and racism and any of the kind of issues related to, to, to that, um, I do have my own personal experiences. And I think this is a, a good time to raise these because these are what shape who I am now and what we're gonna talk about, at least from my side, maybe in the next hour and a half. So this is me on the left with my brother at the age of, I think I was about uh, six months old at that point with this rather superb Afro. And I was born in the industrial city of Derby, a very white part of the East Midlands in the center of England. And one thing I think we're gonna cover today is this idea of intersectionality, okay? So although I'm black, and maybe I've been invited here because I'm black. I also have this experience of being brought up in a working class family to immigrants and as a first generation university attendee. So here's my brother, he's a postman. And this is my mum and dad from Jamaica and St. Vincent respectively. They were both nurses and they came over in the late sixties to the UK. And I, honestly, these are my relatives, even though I'm a foot taller than any of them, they, they are related to me. But, you know, and also, you know, I, my schooling was at a state school, which in its last assessment, um, oops, let me just go back, in its last assessment had um, rather poor achieving status where it was deemed inadequate. And that, you know, so, so just with this slide, I want to point out that I care deeply about a number of different things beyond simply race. I care about um, socioeconomic status and privilege. I care about... Um, kind of um, opportunity and access to educational benefits that people have as a function of a, a, you know, a robust socioeconomic positioning. So I think being black is just one of those intersectional axes that I, I, I'm interested in and what shapes who I am. Who I am now is a black professor in UK higher education and, and I'm, you know, haven't got a lot of time, but the statistics related to that are quite dismal. Okay, so less than 1% of um, the 22,000 or so uh, professors in the UK are black compared compared to the three to three and a half percent or so of the population who are black and the um, well I'll show you some data in a moment um, you know the kind of large um, number of um, the large number of, um, of non-white shall we say academics who are professors in the UK and that's probably reflecting the fact that as um, Priyam Valda Gopal from Cambridge says that whiteness dominates power structures and that leads us into the situation as captured here where we have around about 220,000 academic staff, we have 33% non non-UK nationals, around 2% of black and yet we've got this tiny number and at the bottom here is a rather frightening figure where um, only 25% or 25 black British women are professors in the UK universities out of that about 22,000 now. So just to finish, why as geoscientists do we need to confront um, race uh, or why do we need to acknowledge race? Why do we need to confront and challenge racism? Why do we need to care about socioeconomic circumstances? Why do we need to consider the things that Liz and uh, Jane are gonna talk about in a moment? Well, you know, think about it, right? You know, geoscience is this global, this globally important subject that we're doing. And, you know, this book just came out by Joel Gold looking at geoscience and sustainable development goal. If we want to go and work across communities globally, we're going to have to be able to talk to people who are not like us and work with people and not against them and make them feel welcome and willing to take on board any scientific guidance or policies that we, uh, we, we, we as scientists care about. So thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. And I'm gonna pass it over to um, Liz now. All right, so unlike, unlike Chris, I don't have any statistics for what I'm gonna talk about, but like, like Chris and, and like Jane after me, I am an advocate for Jedi issues, but absolutely not an expert. And I can only bring with me, like Chris, my, my experiences. And I was actually asked to speak today um, because I was diagnosed with ADHD at the end of my PhD journey. 
And well, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey and how I got there. So I grew up poor in the United States, as you can tell from my accent. And when I say like poor in the US, I mean, in between houses a couple of times poor, no health insurance poor. So we're talking like real proper US poor. Um, and so like that, that was a big part of me growing up. I'd moved like 30 times before I got to university. Like it was a, it was a real mess. I started off my university experience um, at a community college, which I think is like below any level in the UK. There is no equivalent in Europe that exists for community colleges. And so I then ended up transferring uh, as a biomedical engineer. I didn't like that. So I switched my majors again. I was a graphic designer for a little bit. I graduated with a bachelor's in graphic design, worked in industry, thought it was quite terrible and it sucked and I hated every second of it. So I went back to school for earth science education. And then I decided to switch straight to geology. And then eventually I finally graduated with my PhD. And as you can tell, there, there was a lot of different movement in, in that situation from one thing to the next. And looking back on it, like I don't know how I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD earlier, but when you look at the numbers of women who are diagnosed with ADHD, like it's really uncommon for women to be diagnosed younger because the way that this sort of uh, stuff is diagnosed is really geared towards men, white men in particular, like younger white men. And so a lot of the issues that I think we're all gonna be touching upon are ones of intersectionality, right? It's not just the fact that I was a woman that made it difficult to get diagnosed. I am also a member of the LGBTQ community. And so when you look at the way those, those individuals are kind of brought up, um, the risk taking associated with ADHD often gets passed off as like uh, something you know associated with that when you're kind of bucking gender stereotypes and gender norms and things like that. And so a lot of the, the ways that I think I could have been helped by the educational system were overlooked because of issues of intersectionality. And so I'm just gonna, I guess, leave it at that, but I want to uh, actually give a shout out to the 900 year old man that finally helped me get diagnosed. So it was like the last class I took as a PhD student in the US, we take classes as part of our, our degree program. And I randomly was asked by, like when I say this guy is old, I mean, he's crypt keeper old. He got his PhD before plate tectonic theory was actually like fully established. Like, he, I'm pretty sure he was on the Titanic, but this old, like 900 year old man, uh, you know, invited me to his class because, you know, he heard me give a talk and, and he was really engaged by some of the things I said for whatever reason. And then he would read my writing and he's like, this is really terrible compared to the way that you deliver, you know, the words and like engage in the concepts and so i don't know what is wrong between the way you think and the way you write but like i don't know you, you need to see somebody about that and so like one professor paying attention to different clues about how i thought like that's what got me diagnosed it wasn't you know any of the systems it wasn't any of my advisors like it was some random professor that cared and it was one it, it was a professor who you wouldn't generally assume would be the person to kind of push you towards that and so I am definitely gonna probably uh, challenge the way that, that you guys engage with your students, those of you who are uh, in academia throughout the next hour and a half and, and we'll see where it goes from there. I think I've rambled enough, it's three something in the morning. I think it's time for Jane who is not too, too much further in front of me time-wise. That's great, thanks Liz. Over to you, Jane. Hi, well, thank you everyone for inviting me to be part of this. This is really um, an important conversation to have and I feel really fortunate to um, be able to talk about it. Um, so I, I was asked to be on the panel um, because I was, uh, the, the back story is that I was harassed as a graduate student and um, that was back in 1999, early 2000s and I filed a complaint um, <laughs> A couple almost a couple decades later in 2016 and that led to a long process um and what like i said on the slide sort of a reluctant education <laughs> into how sexual harassment is handled in academia and um and actually the perverse incentive structures around it 
um, my complaint was leaked to Science Magazine uh, before the investigation was complete and not by me. <laughs> and uh, a story came out and I agreed to be named in that story to give it a little bit more credence. Um, that actually led to a lot of bad things happening. Um, harassment at uh, AGU, and by A, I mean a American geophysically, <laughs> not EGU, <laughs> um, <clears throat> educated then on the processes of how professional organizations handle harassment. Um, hate mail, a death threat written on my door, um, but also lots of good things too. Um, so for example, you have the opportunity to watch a uh, picture a scientist as part of EGU. And I am uh, really grateful to the filmmakers for um, making such a powerful film and also granting me such a huge audience. And I've had the pleasure of talking to um, tens of thousands of people since it's come out, actually. It's been just, just so uh, wonderful and bananas, actually, how, <laughs> how, uh, how it's been received and how we really needed to have this conversation about harassment in science and, um, and discrimination of women in color in science as well. Um, it also led to other good things, um, revision of National Science Foundation policies around funding um, and conversations like this one. So I'm happy to um, get the get the debate or <laughs> the Q&A going so that we can find out what, what uh, you are interested as an, as an audience and um, take it away, Rich. Fantastic, Thank, thanks to all three of you again, um, you know, for not only for participating, but also you know, sharing your personal experiences. Um, I've got a couple of questions that, that all of your, your um, you know, your commentaries have inspired me, but I think I might just pick up with the first question in the Q and A because it builds on some of what the th what a few of you have been saying in the chat. And the question is: Is how can I be a, a better ally? I don't I don't know if you've all seen the question coming in from, sorry, coming in from Laura, um, but it, but it's how can I be a better ally? And you know, and Chris, in in your in the chat, you already alluded to the fact that simply awareness is a really critical part of it. Um, Chris and well, all of you, do do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? You know, it's not just awareness, but but is it education? Is it putting in the time, the research? What what would you ask of someone who wants to be a good ally? Um, yeah, I think it just. I mean, I'll just say briefly. I think it's very difficult, isn't it? Because you know, you have probably have like bronze, silver, and gold standards of allyship, right? And the gold standard would be that you kind of go and read these deep and very traumatic books and you know you, and you you donate money and you give time and and things but a lot of people don't have the the ability or privilege or financial you know um, allowance to do that so you know so i think it's kind of i think it's kind of um, not very easy or very practical to try and judge people on their allyship i just want people to firstly just be aware I just want people to be aware of things and, and allow themselves to be aware, attend things and listen. The actions are critical, but I think the actions or engaging actions is quite challenging, isn't it? If because it can bring you into conflict with friends and family and it and it is, and you know, <laughs> I was kind of choking up a bit at Jane's like introduction there. It's really, really hard to talk about these things. It's really, really hard. Um, so at least just giving some of support to people is, is probably what's needed. And then we can start from that basis of being aware towards actions. I, I think knowing when to engage and knowing when to provide resources, because I was just an international postdoc, like I moved to the UK the week before uh, everything locked down. So my poor PI like had to manage this person that has no understanding of how, how England works. My mom is Irish. And so like the, the pro-English sentiment in our household was not very great. She, Cause she's, she's, she's part of that part of Ireland. And so it was one of those things where um, my, my PI did the best that she could. And when she knew like she couldn't help me with like insurance questions, like she's like, but I do know somebody who had just moved from the US who also had to deal with some of that. So you should talk to this person. And so half the time, like listening, but then when you know that you're, you're no longer going to be an effective ally, knowing 
having those resources to kind of direct your students, right? Like if I ever had, you know, uh, a, you know, a, a black student, like I will never know what it's like to be a black person in the classroom, but I can say, hey, go check out that black and geoscience hashtag. Like you'll find a lot of empowering stories and you might find some other resources that I just can't give you and things like that. Or, you know, go find Dio Latinas if you, you know, want to engage with other Latinas and things like that. So I think knowing where those resources are when you're, when, when, when your help kind of erodes at that point is, is equally as important as being aware, like that's part of the awareness. Yeah, those are all such great points. I, I have a couple um, that have come up, you know, I, I don't know how many people have, have watched Picture a Scientist, but there's a lot of, um, one of the people who is a, a bystander was in that film named Adam Lewis and you know, I get a lot of like some of the biggest differences and the takeaways from the, the film are thinking about Adam and his role. And I'm so grateful that he agreed to participate because I think it's such a powerful um, part of the film because, you know, he was present for a lot of the stuff that happened at when that we were in the field when I was a student. And, um, you know, some of it he uh, helped me through um in the moment but in the film you don't you don't see that part he just mentions that he didn't really understand how hard it was for me and i think that you know it's easy to say like what a doofus like how did he not know <laughs> that this was <laughs> inappropriate behavior but i think that one thing that we should maybe think about is like there have been times when you have been an atom you know, there have been times when I have been an Adam, I've let people down who were around me and wanted me to speak up. And so thinking about that um, and how there are opportunities to speak up all the time, you know, all around us. And that's the thing that I think is most inspiring and, and uh, gives me the most hope about uh, academia and STEM culture is that it's you know, there are institutional structures, but there are also things that we can do every day. You know, the culture is what we do every day, what we say every day, the choices we make every day. And those things can turn on a dime. And so I think that, you know, um, instead of microaggressions, you know, put micro affections out there in the world and make people feel valued and included. And, um, yeah, I'll just stop. I'll just stop there. I could go on and on, <laughs> but <laughs> well, well, I think we might pick up more of these threads from from the other part of Laura's question, which I didn't ask. Which is, of course, you know, none of us want to be reduced to our minoritized status. Um, you know, and, and she asked specifically about when supervising international students, she doesn't want to be patronizing and reducing them. That I suspect that applies in all of those cases. Um, but you know, you can imagine that if um, you know, if Adam was more sensitized to, to the gender issues associated with field, field work, he might have been prepared to be a better ally. But I suspect, Jane, you wouldn't want him to be thinking of you as, you know, the woman on the field trip. So, 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 so how, how, I mean, I, I don't think there's any single right answer to that, but, but what do you think about that in terms of how you would want someone to engage with, especially if it's a line manager or someone who is meant to support you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that um, it's when you it's when you sort of uh, put people put people in boxes that you run into trouble. You know, like if you fully embrace someone's humanity, it's it's hard to not want to you know em empathize with them and help them, right? And so. I feel like um, that that's all that is required in a way, right? Just like we're we're all humans and that is the the level of um, consideration and respect that we deserve. Yeah, that's very powerful. Uh, others? I think just like just being yourself, right? Like we all, all of us on the, the conversation before we had a practice session and it was like me at 4.30 in the morning, which is slightly better than what it is now. And I, I very much came as myself. And it was one of those situations where, because I had, you know, like it's 
you know, Chris and Jane, who are very well known EDI folks and rich, and then like randomly me somehow. It was one of those things that because of their the way that they carry themselves pub publicly, like I didn't even it, it wasn't even a question that like I could just show up as myself. And so like by being yourself in a position like fully yourself, right? Uh, I think that you allow for other people to to really be their their own true selves in that same role. And so I think owning the 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 good, the bad, and well, hopefully not too much of the bad, but like the parts that are messy in academia, still owning those in those spaces where they traditionally have not been allowed, like that that just makes it a a better space for everyone. Yeah, Chris, did you want to come in on as well? Yeah, no, I was just I was just thinking. Um... There are times, though, when, you know, I think the term was step back was used in, in the question, right? And there are times when I've seen hostility towards people who've inserted themselves into a situation in pursuit of being an ally. And so I think that I can understand the jeopardy. I can understand the jeopardy from people who are in the demographic majority. Why, when they see uh, somebody from a historically excluded group, why they may be hesitant, even if they have the will to help, they are nervous to do so because they're worried that by doing so, they will make a bad situation worse. So I do have, I do have sympathy for people asking that question more so than I probably did a year ago, where I just got really cross, because I think you probably know what you could do to be an ally, whether you do it or not is a different thing entirely. So. <laughs> I do think there's often a range of things. Inserting yourself into a, into, a, into a scene where there's physical aggression, that can be challenging, but it's clearly something that might need to be done. Um, telling somebody that that term is inappropriate to use because it's discriminatory, you know, there's no physical threat to you to do that, but you might have to come up against a colleague who's more senior to you to raise that point. But it's clearly something you could do to assist and act as an ally. And it's... And it's I guess I've said this before, but I just want people to do something. <laughs> Brilliant. I, it, it, so there's a, a couple of good questions coming through. Um, I, I see, you know, I, I see Addison's question about how we move this forward in, in Europe, and I want to come back to that. But while we're on the conversation of allyship, I think, you know, I think Daniel's question is very relevant to what we've just been talking about, um, in that there is a reluctance to report when discriminations take place. Um, how can academia do better at, at supporting that? I suspect all of you have thoughts about that, but, but I know, Jane, this was a real challenge for you um, in terms of when you felt free to come forward and talk about this issue. And you alluded to that in your opening comments. So I'm wondering if you could kick off a response to that. Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> you know, I get asked to do a bunch of panels for departments and, and um, lots of, uh, individual events and you know there's there's usually some sort of you know department chair or something in the audience who says like make sure everybody reports <laughs> and they're they're kind of sad when I say no it might it might not be a good idea to report I mean it's it's a really um that was something that was incredibly surprising to me uh that even after I waited until I had tenure until I had, um, you know, perceived status as as a, a tenured professor, um, I had nothing to gain or lose really uh, through reporting, and still the reporting process was just absolutely brutal, um, especially uh, with people knowing about it. I mean, imagine living your entire life <laughs> and and trying to be honest and good and create a reputation that is deserving of respect. And then <clears throat> to take that and to hand it to people who have no care in the world what happens to you. It's, <clears throat> it's uh, like pretty tra traumatizing actually. <laughs> and <clears throat> the thing that was, uh, bizarre to me is that I had no idea it was like that. As an academic, I had no idea. You know, I'd heard about Title IX procedures or like the process by which we um, complain about harassment in the United States. And um, I always kind of thought it was a court of law. 
And here it was actually done by people who could be fired if they don't come down on the right side of the professor. And so, you know, students are looking at this. Um, and now I look at this from a perspective of, all right, the student is going to have to go through this traumatizing reporting period. Then they might be retaliated against. In fact, they are retaliated against in like 95% of uh, reports of workplace uh, harassment. And then uh, nothing is probably going to happen <laughs> to the person that they report on. And so like people aren't, students aren't stupid, right? They're making a calculated decision not to report. So what we have to do is to flip it. We have to make it known that things are happening when reports do come in, when these, when these brave students um, actually report on something, we have to tell them, like, this is what happens to people. I don't want to see a flow chart in a bathroom about how to report. I want to see a flow chart on the wall of a bathroom. Here's what happens if you discriminate based on race. Here's a little arrow to fired. <laughs> I want to see a little arrow to fired on a flow chart when someone, um, you know, sexually harasses a woman. Um, those are the flow charts I want. I don't want to hear about how people can report because we don't handle them properly when people do report. Yeah, honestly, a lot of that reporting structure is to cover the university and not the individuals harmed. Absolutely. That's, that's all I have to add. Nothing, yeah, yeah. nothing positive. Human, human resources is cheerleading for the for the institution often, right? It's to kind of, and we've seen that at Imperial College institution I just left, right? You know, bullying, harassment, it was all proven, it was all reported, you know, non-disclosure agreements were signed, people had to leave the institution, but not the people who perpetrated those incidents. So it's like, why would you, why would you bother? So I, I just wanted to burst into applause for Jane's point there. I want to see transparency in the accountability, really. I, I, I don't want things squirreled away in rooms and, and people to disappear quietly. I want, I want it to be known as a minoritized person that if I report, then something, what will happen? And if something happens, I want everybody to know about it because that will encourage more reporting. I think, and I guess that's where Jane, where you were going with your point is, I think it would, I think it builds confidence in the system such that more reports will come forward. And then I suspect it will be floodgates will open it opening, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm also, you know, kind of reminded of like the role of leadership in this, you know, and the quotation that I think is so powerful is this one by Grinter and Whitaker, the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. And that is so true. And so if you think about, you know, how did you do as a leader? Well, what did you tolerate? What happened under your watch? It's not the good things that you do. It's the worst behavior you tolerated. And so that's like, you know, a simple, you know, for me to say, not a leader, <laughs> it's a simple thing to do, you know, don't tolerate it. Um, and if you, if you have to tolerate it because of the policies and procedures that you have set up, change them in advance, don't get caught. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot, a lot to build on here. You know, absolutely all of this is true. And I, I couldn't agree more with what all of you've said. And, and, you know, and, and as Chris said, HR departments exist to protect the organization and institution. HR departments are also very good at weaponizing employment law. It's often illegal to disclose the outcome of these investigations. And that is highly problematic. And I think we all have an obligation to challenge and push it, push the barriers of that. But I also know that there's been some real positive interventions made from esteemed societies. So, you know, the National Academy of Science is kicking out memberships. And because that's not employment, there is a little bit more latitude. So, so should we see more leadership from esteemed societies about who is allowed to attend conferences, the awards and fellowships we give, and or even retracting those fellowships? Bits of that exists, right, Rich? So there's some organizations when you're awarded something, you have to sign mm -hmm. something saying you've not been 
bad. <laughs> I'm not sure how else to explain it. Um, and I have seen um, cases, well, Dawkins recently got his wrist slapped by the humanists right. in the US, right? So there are, there are cases of, of um, organizations. And what's kind of reassuring about that is, I think I, have, I, I really respect organizations and people who, 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 who recognize that in the past, they've perhaps not been as good as they should be, mm. and they have changed. And their standards and their acceptance or what they're willing to accept has, has changed. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with in that kind of way saying sorry and actually and, and updating your policies. Really. Yeah. And if I could come to, to Liz, because I think you're probably the earliest career researcher on the panel. And you know, I, I don't want to presume that that makes you in the most vulnerable, you know, in this particular area. But seeing that type of action, does that would that empower you? What do you need to see, you know, to empower you if, if you felt you needed to make a complaint? So I actually spoke on somebody's behalf and had mm -hmm. HR totally uh, mishandle it. And so for me personally, I think I just, I lack the self-preservation instincts to, to, to not speak up on that front. But I definitely, I think I would have felt better about it had I seen positive outcomes beforehand. And so it's one of those things where I know exactly my date of unemployment based on the end of my, uh, my postdoc. And I actually turned down a job at a place that sent us a sexual, not a job, but like an interview at a place that sent us a sexual harasser. So it's one of those things where part of it is job security, but part of it's also like knowing your limits of what you're willing to tolerate. And in places that have good track records of supporting people that report or societies that like throw the book at scoundrels, like I am going to put my applications in there. I'm going to give those people my money before I will go back to like the serial offenders. Brilliant. Okay. We're not going to let, oh, sorry, Chris, come go on. No, I was just going to say, it's interesting as well, because another thing I've talked to people about is jeopardy for senior people as well. So Jane and I are both tenured and yourself, Rich, as well. But there's still significant harm that can be visited upon us, you know, tomorrow or in the next 20 years as well. So there's still a calculated risk, even when we engage in panels like this. You know, there was Chris and Jane shouting off their big mouths, at, you know, to this big society and talking, you know, there's still people listening, right? And we're still trying to work out whether or not we think it's worth while doing this, because we still have things to lose. And you know, I think therefore, you know, with Jane, with her experience and being a woman and me with my experience of being black, you know, there's other people out there who have got a lot more capital than us who could be out here doing this really and, um, you know, changing the structure so that things are better than, than we are. We're just talking about our experiences. Yeah. It's, it's what I, so I'm going to push back as a person with the least amount of job security, like from the bottom up, you, you guys have more security than I can even imagine at this point. And it's one of those things that the people that do need to be changing this, they're not going to be sitting here listening to this, right? Like the people that need to be yelled at yeah. about just being total human scum, like they're not, they're not spending their time at the EGU online session about diversity. And so instead of like worrying about that, like, I don't know, I, I feel like we need to, like, instead of hemming and hawing about the people that should be doing the work like there's only so much effort that we can put forth and so i think we need to try and bring the people who will do the work the people younger than me because i'm actually shockingly old for a person with no job security um but it's one of those things where i think like the effort needs to be in the next generation because clearly the folks above y'all if they could have solved the problem they would have already and they clearly didn't I I, I, actually, I, I, that's really pessimistic and horrible, but it's one of those things like it's always easier to like judge upwards because you don't, I don't know exactly what it's like to be a tenured professor. There's some hells that I have no understanding of, but it's one of those things that that security that's so lacking is so like front and focused in my brain. So if I imagine if I got that right, oh, it'd be so much easier to do stuff when in reality it comes with its own set of awful. So on, on that note, though, I, you know, some of my biggest sort of uh, pushing to make change failures have been not going to leadership first, to be honest. Um, 
because you have to, in order to show that, that uh, you need to do something, you have to show that they won't do something, right? <laughs> so, so I think it's important to always go to leadership, um, give them an opportunity, not, not just because, you know, it's sort of, you know, you need to give them the opportunity so that you can say that they're not doing anything, but also people change, right? I mean, there's been a lot of, um, I mean, I've grown over the last five years so maybe I should expect that our leaders have changed as well and that we should afford them that opportunity. I mean, it might not work out, but um, some of my biggest failures have been, you know, people saying like, why didn't you just tell me? <laughs> why start a huge student petition? Why not just tell me so that I can just do something about it? Um, so that's been, that's been something that I, that I always keep in mind now because it, it's something that when it, does go well, it's really great. I've just, I've just seen, I've just seen Liz's put comment to the chat it's about trust. You know, like sometimes it's just such a huge trust deficit in a system and in people. Whenever people want to squirrel me away into a corner and have a private in their chat, it's sometimes trying to dampen the fire. And sometimes it's, it, you know, so. I, I know what you're saying, Jane, but so I've, I've had terrible experiences in the same way where you've entrusted people, you've entrusted the system and, and nothing's arisen and it's simply a way of kicking the can. So I, I don't know if you've got any ways of, I don't know how to judge that, you know, even though I'm an old man, I'm not sure how to make that call when I should be a good citizen and go with my request to the boss or whether I should just write a petition or kick off on social media you know I'm not, I'm not sure what you and Liz think about how do you make that call because you get it wrong right and I get told off yeah I mean in the example I'm thinking about Margaret Linen was the leadership and so <laughs> that's a pretty good <laughs> place to start for a leader who who will care about she was the one who did all of the uh, work to incorporate a code of conduct at, at uh, AGU, for example. And so it depends, it definitely depends on the leader. But um, I think, I think it is good to start there and then just give them a few days, let them, <laughs> let them stew on it. And then, <laughs> and then see if nothing happens in a couple of days, you know, it, it can't delay anything, but it's, um, it's good to get that, um, kind of checked off the list, I guess. Always put yeah. those requests in writing so that you have a paper trail too. Yeah. And Liz, do you want to do you want to elaborate on the point you you put in the in the um the chat about um you know I tell you, you know, one of the reasons you know I do tweet as much as I do. It's not because I'm perfect. It's not how I know what to do, but it's basically to put myself, expose myself, right, as a leader. And, and, and therefore to make myself accountable and, and, and hopefully then it, it empowers other people to trust me, right? So, so I think your point about the obligation of leaders to somehow, sim even if it is only performative, to simply show that they're, a, that, they're, that they're someone you could trust is really, really important. But what do you, what do you look for in that? Uh, I think it's one of those things, like I mentioned the phrase character development, like I don't know about y'all, but like me 10 years ago, like, oh, Oh, I would not be my friend 10 years ago. 15 years ago, I might have smothered myself in my sleep with a pillow, like just really insufferable. And it's just one of those things where I think I look for admission of like, oh, I was wrong, like mm. humanity mm. almost, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. one of those things that people can admit when they're wrong. Like I don't expect anybody else to be perfect because like Anybody that knows me knows I'm far, far from that sort of creature, but I just expect people to like admit when they're wrong and learn, right? Everyone's a little bit defensive if you call them out, but if they really, if somebody is, is giving you the grace of their time to correct you, like respect that and then, you know, learn from it. And so the way that people interact with one another, if, you know, somebody calls you out, you're like, oh yeah, no, that was, I can understand what you meant from that point. I can see how I didn't address it like fair enough. And I think you and I had a back and forth once about like being poor people with bad teeth. And I mentioned my like awful experience with the mm. NHS. Like, I'm so sorry to all the British people, but for like mental health issues, if you're coming from another country, the NHS was not great for me. And you're like, oh yeah, well, I can see that, you know, I've been here for so long. And it's one of those things where it's, you're like open and willing to accept mm. that. And so for me, that exchange was like, all right, this dude's 
this dude's on the level and humans I know in, in the meat space have told me he's on the level. So a lot of it's reputation, how you treat mm. people that I care about and also mm. how you interact with other people when folks are watching. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't think that we as any of us on this panel are going to let leadership off the hook. I think all of us believe in structural issues. And I think a lot of these problems would go away if there's a lot more leadership. But I'd like to pivot to one of the questions in the Q&A that that you know that is a, that, that takes us to a slightly different direction and that is what would you say to minority early career researchers this is the the question from swinda what would we say to minority early career scientists that may or may not have experienced discrimination one way or another and are worried it might obstruct their future in academia so so we we we've, we've tried to give a pretty realistic commentary here and talked about the obligations of leadership to do better what, but, but you know, there's a lot of early career researchers who are making really, really difficult choices right now. What would we tell them? It's a very good question. I, I guess I'm never a big fan of trying to advise the people who are the least powerful in these situations to do anything to kind of fix something. I, I, I honestly always struggle with this, this question because, you know, send them on resilience training. Mm. You know, let them know about the reporting structures. You know what, you know, give them sort of like, you know, kind of presentation skills training so that they can talk with more authority. You know, like all of these things are fighting against a system and against individuals who have no care for those things. Yeah. And, and I think, <laughs> I think again, Liz just put down about doom and gloom in the chat. I mean, yeah, I always feel a bit doomy and gloomy whenever I try and think about how I think awareness is one thing. I, I, I guess one thing I can say that's positive is that I think the question was, I've not experienced it yet. Yeah. What I can say to that person is be aware that it happens. Mm -hmm. You're in this session, therefore you're interested. Be aware that it's happened and then maybe, maybe try and find practical ways of, of addressing that. Like I gave a session last week for urge on self-care, you know, and that's really important for me is being aware of how I can look after myself physically, mentally to allow me to progress scientifically. Mm -hmm because that's what I, I am, a scientist. Um, so maybe there are some practical things to do like that. So I, I don't know exactly what, what the subtext or wider context of Swinda's question is, but I must admit, I read it as, I've, I've got a choice to make about whether I continue in this career. Can you guys give me some positive news that things are getting better? Is, is, is this great debate evidence that things are getting better? Or is it too soon to see whether or not we can really change the system? I've, as a young, as an earlier career person, it's hard to see any future in academia with the way that the pandemic has like totally cratered out the job market. Not gonna like, Lucky. as a person on the job market, like, it, and I'm even more comfortable than most people who have postdocs. So I like magically got one while I had one mm. that I applied for before the pandemic and like money fell out of the sky somewhere just for this one job. And it's one of those things where I, this probably isn't great advice, but like know, know your limits. Like what's it worth mm. to you? Is it like, is your career in academia worth uprooting your family and moving to other places? Like I grew up moving because I came from like transient people. So like moving is fine for me, but it's not cool for some other people. And so like knowing the things that you require to make you your life livable, like don't, don't sacrifice those for your future in academia. I know that's not the advice you're probably looking for, but like I moved and it sucked over this last year. And so I like made a, a bunch of really rash decisions and now I'm way happier. I don't know if they were the right decisions at the time, but they seem to be working out now. Yeah, I mean, the, another thing is to think about is that, you know, a lot of things are bad at first maybe that can get better over time. I mean, right now I, sort of surround myself with collaborators who are the most wonderful people in the world. And that's something that I've only been able to do as I kind of progress in my career. But that's something that you, you can do later on. When you're just starting out, I feel like you, you know, your advisor tells you like, oh, go collaborate with that person over there. And they're horrible. And you have to just stick it out. Um, 
but there are things that you can do and advantages that come out only later in your career. Later in your career, there's, there's also a lot of things that are negative about the job too, but, but I feel like um, there are things that you, that you can do and that, and changes that you can make, you know, that's, that's kind of a cool thing about being on the other side of having a permanent job is that you can be one of the people who helps. And I, I find that an incredibly rewarding part of my job is being someone who can, you know, has seen all of this, the ridiculous things that happen. And now I'm, I'm in a position where I can help to change them. And that gives me a a huge amount of satisfaction, just being there for students and helping to change the policy so that they make sense for people who uh, have had experiences like I have. And, and Chris, did you want to elaborate on your comment in the chat that, that you, you've seen some change over 17 years? Yeah, I've been in academia about 17 years, and I think that um, <clears throat> one improvement, if it can be called that is that these conversations are happening more publicly. You know, they are brought up at staff meetings or faculty meetings, as they call them in the US. And um, they are on the great debate at EGU. They are kind of, you know, AGU had EOS um, last month or a few months ago, which was dedicated to diversity and inclusion. Granted, a lot of this was precipitated by the death of George Floyd, but, you know, there's a catalyst there, but at least those things are happening now. And I'm hoping that we can't put the lid back on the box now, that these, these discussions are going to keep on happening in more and more forums and in more and more public spaces. And also, I think, um, I think uh, kind of Liz and Jane have both touched on this, like going back to the, the generation before me even and the current PhD students and having, having them hear this, right? Having them hear that these things are inappropriate, having them hear that some senior people, Jane and myself, and yourself, Rich, you know, we do feel deeply um, passionate about this and we want it to change. So those PhD students will see that and, and feel like there is a better future out there, despite, you know, some of mine and Liz's grumpiness, at least in the, in the answers, you know, I, I'd like to think that there is some positivity out there. I mean, yeah, I, I, I will pivot like from my, my like bag of salt misery. Like the only reason I'm here is because people from that generation made sure that I was here. Right, like I, I had excellent undergrad mentors who made sure I did research. I had, uh, you know, people who were, were at the internship I had, like they made sure that I got the skills I needed. A woman at NSF, like she's like, of all the people we had at extra funding, like you did the most outreach. We need more people like that. Like that's why you got that fellowship, not like all other footing like so as much as I grump about y'all y'all olds like you're not even that much older than me because this is my second career but I'm you know still uncertain but it's one of those things that as much as I grump about that that cohort like those are the people that made sure I was here and so I think finding those people like don't don't waste your time on the turds I'm officially not friends with Liz anymore yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um, you know, there's I another thing, like, friends. I don't want to be too, I don't want to be too <laughs> rosy about this, you know, yeah. like, I totally alternate between, like, you know, joy in my profession, and like total spite, right? And it's just like, you know, when the joy is gone, like, it's like, who are they to kick me out, you know? Like, who are they to tell you that you can't be in this profession? You know, that's ridiculous. No one can tell you where you can and cannot be. Come on. So <laughs> it's one, but like when you're like, I want, I want that job. And then I can, you know, they're, they're currently telling younger folks that you cannot be here by not giving us jobs. I know. Yeah. 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 But that's not, that's not your guys' fault. So like that, that, that pivots away. It's one of those things that when, when you're at this career stage, your level of misery oscillates, like how bitter you feel about a job rejection. I'm currently on like hospice care for a job I know I didn't get like waiting for the rejection. So like I'm at the bottom of the trough there for that like <laughs> grumpiness. So I apologize. But I think I'd like to think though people like yourself, Liz, and other people are really vocal in a more junior career stage. There are people out there more senior who deeply, deeply want people like you in the academy. Right? I, I mean, Give like who CV. are actually 
No, but it, but it, they were actively out there looking for people in terms of collaborations, in terms of jobs. With you know, I think, and I and I and I said again, you that question, what has changed in seventeen years? I suspect seventeen years ago that might not have been as common, but there are people who are who are out there who 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 value that vision of academia as much as all the fancy papers and the and the and the and the, sh and the stack of money. So I really yeah, want it, to keep beating that drum to make it. You know, maybe it's just me and Jane and Rich, right? But there are people out there. No, it, it's one of those things too that I think if I were as salty as I am now, like 17 years ago, they would have escorted me out before I even got on a panel about, you know, grumping about things. And so I definitely, even, so I went back to school in 2010. That's when I first learned about what a rock was. And even in that last 10 years, like I've already seen the uptake, like the, the Me Too movement has really, I think started to flourish and people becoming more aware of racial injustices. And it's one of those things that as a person who's gone through this entire like awakening, I guess, as a student, it's, um, it's been very positive, but it's also one of those things where I feel like it doesn't happen fast enough, but I'm sure everybody feels that way who cares about these issues. So I, I, th there's lots of questions piling up in the Q&A that I've somewhat neglected. And I do want to come back to this EU question. I, I might even ask Helen to, to comment on this one. But before I do, I just, you know, all of you opened up your presentations commenting on some aspect of intersectionality. I know, you know, there's an aspect of it, of it in what, what Liz is talking about in terms of especially the intersection of these characteristics with being a precarious member of the community, right? That That is profoundly an issue. And I do think it's perverse that we are making some gains to make the academy more accommodating in terms of minoritized characteristics, just when a whole bunch of external factors are, are really undermining the job market anyway. And I think all of us have an obligation to consider all of that in the whole when we think about the next generation. I, I, and, and I do think leaders have the obligation to think about that much more broadly than in terms of H indices. And, and well, I'm not gonna mention that because otherwise Chris will go off on one in terms of metrics and indices. I, I saw but, that furrowed brow. Yeah, but but I think there is, but I parked this conversation around EU and I, I, I've run into this myself. A lot of us have run into this sort of like, there's different cultural views about EDI that this is more of an American issue or, or you know, so, Helen, as, as EGU president, and, and I'll open up to the rest of you, but I'm wondering if you could come in and, and sort of comment upon how, because I agree, I think the EU is, I think European institutions are a little bit behind the American institutions in this conversation. So how do we get up to speed? Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um, I, I've been listening to the discussion with interest, actually, and 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 I've I I actually have had conversations with people even in within recent weeks who've actually said to me. Um, oh yeah, no, discrimination's not the same in Europe. Um, you know, Americans make much more noise about it, and but we're different. Culturally, we are different. And it, it actually makes me really, really cross. Um, and, and you asked, how can we, how can we change the conversation? I think it comes back to something that all of our panelists have alluded to. And in fact, you yourself alluded to, Rich, which is making people more aware that this is real and it is happening you know i and and i i have to say some of the things that have been said already today really resonated with me because i am more than happy to say and this is an important point that now as a senior researcher in the position that i'm in i am prepared to say as a junior scientist when i first started working in the field I experienced harassment, but I was advised not to report it because it would affect my future career path. And I don't think things have changed that much in Europe since I was a young researcher. And I mean, I'm 55 now, and we're talking about when I was 21. So I think a lot of what we're talking about is changing the conversation in Europe. It's about raising awareness, but it's about organizations such as EGU and all sorts of other organizations and institutions taking it seriously, recognizing it, acknowledging that it does happen. 
and making people feel that they are in a safe space to be able to say, this has happened to me. But I do believe that EGU has a really pivotal role to, to take in this. And actually, Jane said something that really has stuck with me. In fact, I wrote it down because, Jane, I may, I may misquote you here, but this was what I heard. And Jane said, the measure of a leader is the worst behavior they will tolerate. Well, I'm sorry. I, one of the reasons I was keen for us to have this discussion in this space is for me, it is zero tolerance. And I want to make sure that organizations such as EGU are holding this up and saying, this is not okay. It is happening and it is not okay. And that we won't tolerate it. And I do think that's the role that organizations can play. And it really worries me when, you know, I hear Chris, for instance, say that he's worked for an institution in the UK where, you know, it's kind of been hidden away and it didn't happen. And they, but they say, oh, but we did something about it. Yeah, but what did you do about it? And why did you feel the need not to point to it and say, this happened and this is what we did about it? And that's what we need to do in Europe. We need to be less scared to point to it, give it a name and say it's not okay. Great. Right. So, so I don't know if you saw in the chat, but does anyone want to sort of come in about some specific suggestions, not just around changing the dialogue, but changing policy? Yeah, uh, Rich, I, I, I had a point I wanted to raise in response mm -hmm. to Helen's but I think a lot of what we've talked about so far have been like what we would consider the big ticket discriminations, right? So sexual harassment, racial discrimination, you know, I think we've not really talked enough about the very, very small day to day things, which unless you're actually attuned to them, microaggressions is I think the term Jane used, you probably just passed you by and you don't realize that it's just the constant chipping away at of those smaller things, which seem like they're just part of the machine, which are actually really the problem. It's not the fact I'm afraid of being beaten up by clan members in the street for being black. I'm more concerned about the fact that people just assume I'm not a speaker at a conference because I'm black or, you know, or, you know, there's different levels of things which undermine your ability. And, you know, and, and I'll, I'll raise it, you know, because I think EGU and AGU and a lot of these professional societies don't realise quite how their machinery also serves to undermine historically excluded groups, you know? And we've had this conversation about the Marie Tharp medal in the TS division, it's been going on, I'm not gonna bring it up again here, <laughs> but it's things like that, which are the tools with which historically excluded groups are being held back from progressing. And they look small, and when people get cross, it looks petty, but they are just as important because they are happening a hundred times a day. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of what we need to think about are also some of the, 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 the more minor things. And it's not just EGU, it's not just that. I'm just saying in general, there's things which, unless you're hyper tuned to it, and I think I'm probably too attuned to it, we might miss. There's probably a power law that describes the frequency magnitude, you know, of uh, <laughs> harassment and discrimination <laughs> events, <laughs> since we're all geoscientists here. <laughs> I'd love to see that. That'd be great. <laughs> because, because it's true. I mean, put it this way. Let's keep that analogy going then, Jane. The little mag the small magnitude events, which are regular, weaken the structure, right? And then something comes along of moderate magnitude and the whole thing comes down. You don't even need the big event at that point. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I get misgendered all the time. I actually got like aggressively misgendered at AGU. I don't know, the last time it was in the meat space. And it's one of those things that like normally it's fine, it's fine, but like there's then there's just this one straw that just breaks it. Or, you know, somebody uses some disparaging homophobic nonsense words. You're like, all right, I'm gonna burn it all down now. So, yeah, can, and it comes, say, yeah. You're right, Liz, it comes this? at a huge risk. Oh yeah. yeah. Can we segue this in terms of what EGU can do? Because it's like, I, because I, I think this is a good time to segue it into how EGU and the structure can also manage it. Mm -hmm. Is that is that cool with the other speakers? Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where um, you want to make the space for like, just say that you're looking at your organization and you're like, all right, we need, we don't have enough like women here based on the number that should be there. You know, just say we have a society, right? There should be 40% women based on the people in the degree path or whatever. 
make space for the people that are missing before before they complain, right? Like not they complain, but it's one of those things. If you see that there's a hole in your organization, make space for those people so that they don't have to do the work. Like it's not Chris's job to make sure every black academic in the UK like has a seat at the table. Like all those microaggressions, dude's got enough work. Like I don't need to make sure every, you know, queer person or everybody with ADHD is well taken care of. Like if those are issues that you see within your organization, like do the work yourself to make that seat at the table. Like, I think I, was it Imperial that's like, we're not gonna go to places where homosexuality is like illegal. Yeah. Like yeah. you don't need a gay person to tell you that they, they probably don't wanna get murdered going to look at rocks. Like you can, you can cut that out of your curriculum before that person has to like out themselves and be like, this is gonna be a problem for me or you know whoever, or if you have like a trans person, like any member of the LGBTQ community is kind of at risk there. And it's one of those situations where like make, make space at the t table for the people that are missing. Don't wait for the one person that has managed to sneak their way through the pipeline to have the burden of doing it. And like, that's something that all of the, the different groups can do, right? Like you don't need to have a person who's gender non-conforming or trans to say, hey, maybe we should use some pronouns in our in our emails or we should have pronoun buttons at EGU just to, so that somebody doesn't like yell at me for you know peeing in the in you know the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the other side of that, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've heard that something won't be tolerated, but unless you have the how worked out, how will it not be tolerated? It's yeah. kind of just saying something. So I feel like there need to be, you know, policies and procedures laid out for what happens yep. when something happens. How will you not tolerate it? Are there policies that that would result in people, you know, for being banned from from ever attending EGU again? I understand this is quite controversial from some discussions of two or three years ago because mm -hmm. it's firstly you've got to be able to police that at the venue door almost is like one bit of the conversation I remember hearing and that is one thing you know can they register and if they can't register then they can't physically enter Moscone building mm -hmm. let's say for mm -hmm. AGU or the conference center in Vienna so maybe then it is easier to kind of police that mm -hmm. decision that somebody's not allowed to attend how long it lasts for, you know, they're banned for two or three years, maybe they're not eligible for awards or medals. Maybe there is some, maybe there are things that can be put in place. I just worry, Rich, that sometimes people lack teeth <laughs> to do these yeah. things. Yeah. They, yeah. they kind of, it's like, I think, you know, like Jane says, it's easy to say, we, you know, we don't tolerate this, but the, the how is, the how is, is, they know how, actually. What am I talking about? They know how. They just they just haven't got the bottle to do it, actually. It's one of those things too that I noticed that a lot of the problematic people, like if you if you read some of their abstracts, you're like, who the hell let this through? And so some of it I think is accountability for the sessions, right? There was recently I saw on Twitter like an anthropology session where somebody was like dragging indigenous folks' beliefs. They're like, oh, you know, we don't let creationism in. Yeah. Like, who let, who let that abstract through? Mm -hmm. Who let that abstract through? And, I, and mm -hmm. I think honestly, like not only do you kind of th throw the hammer at certain things, like the people that let, like that didn't address that at the door, like I'm not gonna let this into my session. This is trash. You have to address those people too. It's not just the offenders. It's the people that allow for them to, to th that give them a voice in the space. Mm -hmm. So just to just to quickly jump in, but I don't want to take up too much of the airspace because I actually want to listen to our speakers because from the perspective of EGU, I want to know what they think we can do better. And that's what I want to be able to take away. But I just wanted to comment on this, this um, observation about letting abstracts through. I have to say we are getting much more rigid and much tighter about the things that are sneaking through. But you're absolutely right, Liz. There is there are levels, you know, we are reliant on conveners going, no, that's not right. But even if they do sneak through, we do have mechanisms in place that mean we do 
ask conveners to change the titles of sessions. We do reject some abstracts that we think are inappropriate. But there is also, I think Chris kind of alluded to this, we also have to strike a balance about making sure that we, you know, we don't silence some people who, you know, bring the other part of the of the discussion. So it, it we do have those balances and checks and balances in place. And I think it's about making sure that they're implemented as well as they can be. Right. Did anyone else want to come in on on any of those particular issues, or have other comments about EGU? I mean, I, I've got some questions piling up in the Q and A that I can circle back to. Right. So, well, oh yeah, go ahead, Jane. Sorry. Oh, I think one of the things that that AGU has done that is really pretty amazing um, has been to, you know, pay for students legal fees or some legal consultation um, which is a, a big commitment on their part um, i think that we could do more professional organization wise in terms of the passing the trash situation whereby people harass at one institution are fired or essentially fired and then just move on to another one i know one individual who's moved four times now every time gets a promotion, a raise, and more power. And now is leading a, uh, a research organization. And so, you know, what, what can professional organizations do about that? You know, could, could we have some sort of list of people who have been accused? And so when you are going to, you know, get, put someone up for a job, can you check a list, right? Can you just do a background check? that people agree to when they apply for the job. Is that something that we can do? I mean, this is something that has been bothering me for a long time. You know, we look at the Catholic church and how they move priests from place to place, continuing their abuse. And frankly, we do the same thing. So I think it's one of those things where not only do we need those in place, you have to make sure people actually do them. So there was a guy who was at Idaho State University who groped a woman after she had like had a very traumatic experience and this was known like this was written about and he got sent to the university of south florida like and nobody did the background check and so even though you had like i don't his name is herb mashner there's a whole story about it he is an absolute scumbag and i don't mind shaming him publicly it's fine i'm fine with it but it's one of those things where it's a situation where you have to have those in place but we also need people to enforce it like the fact that nobody did the background check, like how many postdocs is that? How many scientists, like, you know, how many jobs is that that you could have gotten for the millions of dollars you threw at this guy? Like how many scientists aren't gonna get to be academics because you hedged your bets on the scoundrel? Yeah, so I wanna maybe pull back and consider the geosciences as a whole. There is, a, you know, Helen replied to this talking about how legally problematic, especially across borders, it is to compile lists. But if anything, Helen, I think it means it's all the more important to have clear policies such there is a clear and transparent decision. And of course, maybe that only captures a small number of people, but if it's on the public record that someone has been banned from EGU for three years, that is, is indisputable fact, that's actionable. Um, so I think that you know there, there's elements of, of moving that. But you know, there are a lot of comments in the chat about drinking culture at conferences, beer culture in, in geosciences. We all know about the issues around field work. It's a discipline that was you know, basically founded on basically colonialism and toxic masculinity if you go all the way back. Um, are we talking about a problem in academia or does the geosciences have a particularly acute problem that will need particularly acute interventions? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just comment briefly on that. We, we cover this in this paper, which is coming out in Nature Geosciences by Dowie et al. So we got all this data around uh, <clears throat> representation of ethnic and racial minority groups in the UK. And so that was the conclusion we came to in that paper is that there is a set of things which are society wide and academia wide, which are barriers to mm -hmm. uh, historically excluded groups. But then there are things which are very specific or amplified in the geosciences. And you picked upon 
two of the ones that we covered there, Rich, which are the colonial past, the masculinity and the, and the kind of culture and some of the obsessions around things like macho, things like field work. Yeah. Um, so I think there are some specific things that we need to tackle in geosciences and, and they're being written about and they're well known. And again, it's a case of just getting on with fixing some of these issues. Yeah. Anyone else want to come in on that one? That's such a tough one. I mean, some of the reasons that geo, the geosciences are, are great also make it some of the reasons why it is hard to fix. You know, I mean, I think that the, um, the field work aspect, field work by nature is just, you know, you find a mosquito in your cornflakes while you're camping and you flick it out. You find a mosquito in your cornflakes when you're at a restaurant and you send it back, right? There are different standards for how we behave in different situations. And I personally love the different standard where we behave differently in the field, um, but somehow we still have to treat people with respect and professionally, even though we are in sort of a more informal environment where you talk about going to the bathroom. And, you know, and so I, I think that we do have a bit more of a challenge in that respect, but I also think that it's one of the, the, the things that makes the geosciences really amazing and wonderful to study is, is that kind of um, experience and camaraderie that frankly, like, you know, a chemist doesn't have that, right? So. So, so maybe building on that theme, I see that we only have 10 minutes left. So I, I think I'd best come back to the three of you for some just sort of concluding reflections and, and such. Um, I don't know, basically, uh, to forewarn you, I'm going to babble for a few moments so you can get your thoughts together, but I'll, I'll go in reverse order. So Jane, then Liz, then Chris. Um, but, you know, literally any sort of reflections on what we've spoken about, or maybe things that you think that we've not spoken about um, that you want to sort of finish. But if I can ask... Um, you know, maybe pick up a little bit of the theme that Jane had, which is, okay, we've, we've been quite forthright about some of the challenges we face, but there, but there are positive actions that, that people are taking. There's positive actions that the next generation of researchers can do, um, and hopefully a more supportive environment. So if we could probably not, you know, let's not look through the world through rosy glasses when we know that there's big challenges, but if we could maybe end with a bit of optimism, especially for the next generation of attendees that are in the audience. So over to you, Jane. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm still in this profession because I think it's, uh, because I still love it, right? And I think that uh, you have to keep in mind uh, why you got into the field when you did, and that there's a lot of good um, sort of easier aspects once you are a bit more senior. You're less um, at the mercy of people that, you know, have been doing bad things, and you can be part of a culture change. And to me, that's, that's really one of the reasons why I have stuck with it. I will also say that, you know, there's so much focus on having students have um, a lot of persistence and resilience skills. And I think that we need to really build up different skills through the, the period of being a graduate student and then, and then the postdoctoral training. I think there are other things that we have not flexed in terms of skill creating, like working in teams, for example, um, that are, are things that I think we can, we can focus on in the future. Thanks very much, Jane. And Liz? So I think one of the things that is a real kind of pitfall for a lot of people working towards a better future is burnout, right? Like, you can only read so many stories about harassment or, you know, doom scroll through Twitter and see so many like microaggressions. It's one of those things where I think my advice would be to vary the way that you kind of expend your energy. You can like burn it down one day, but the next day, like if all, so I, I 
try and vary. So sometimes it's about changing the system and then other times it's about building up other people who will also, who are part of the system that you know I think should exist in, the, in academia. And so that's the way I think I, it, I have found to fight burnout is by uplifting other people while it's still like, you know, bringing shame to where shame ought to be brought and trying to vary the way that you, you, you hate and love things simultaneously. Cause I hate the geosciences and I love it at the same time. I tried a million different jobs, right? Like I had like four or five different majors and, and this is the one for me, like the worst day in academia is still better than the best day as a graphic designer for me, hands down. And I just try and do at least one thing a day that makes uh, this job better for other people. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, but I think everybody's got to do their part. It's not just the people here. And that's something you could bring to people who may not be like part of the conversation at this moment, right? Like you can empower them to make those small changes so that it's a little bit less burdensome for the days where you need to make the big ones. No, Thanks. That, that's very that's very powerful, Liz. Thanks very much. And Chris? Um, yeah, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, I guess it's probably worth for an early career researcher bearing in mind why they got into the subject in the first place. It's an, geoscience is, is very, very important, as I touched upon in the last comment in my presentation at the start. You know, it's globally significant. It can save lives and livelihoods. It can empower people, you know. We have an incredible job to do, an important job to do, and presumably the early career researchers right on this call or not, you know, they've chosen it because of some aspect of that, right? They're curious about the world and they want to use that curiosity to make the world a better place for people. And so keeping yourself tied to that initial stimulation for getting into it is really important. Now, that doesn't really address your question of why they should be positive, because again, that's something that they're bringing to their experiences they're going through the academic ranks i think what i would do to answer that specific question is just go back to what i said earlier on there is an increasing body of people i believe who are passionate about things outside of science quote unquote right and that is or academia in terms of just raising money and writing papers there are people who are equally as passionate and view the value for science of being inclusive okay so i don't like it when people separate off like well there's science and then there's this thing about G G jedi right over here i see them as the same thing because otherwise we run the risk of excluding hugely talented people who will make bigger contributions to science in the future so they're not separate things right so i encourage those early career researchers to try and i don't know if ride those two horses is an american phrase but try to kind of handle those two things the science and the things they like doing but also um the other stuff, you know, just being a good human being, just treating people with respect. Like think about how you make the work environment a better place. And through that, you, um, you, you, you befriend people and you meet, I think Jane said this, you meet amazing people. Liz says she was too poor for horses, plural <laughs> growing up. <laughs> I don't, I don't, we don't have horses in the UK. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think that's, um, that's what I would say is, you know, bring that bit of yourself with you and then be aware that there's a growing body of people who care about other things and, and want to make academia and geosciences an awesome place. Brilliant. But thanks so much, Chris. Um, and you know, I'm going to wrap up and pass over to Helen in a moment. Um, apologies to those of you whose questions I wasn't able to, to bring in. I, I think we got a, a lot of, of what you were asking and commenting on and, and definitely keep the conversation going. If there was one question that, that I wanted to have time for, I didn't, wasn't able to come back to, it was um, circling back to a comment that Chris made in the beginning about how to be a good ally. And of course, as, as you've heard, there's so many different dimensions to discrimination. All of us need to be allies to someone. Um, and of course, Chris said, you know, there's a bronze, silver, and gold standard. And, you know, not all of us have the capacity to, to be, you know, to put all of the time and investment in gold. But I think we have to ask all of ourselves, what is the bare minimum for bronze? The bare minimum, right? What is the bare minimum to avoid the types of issues that Liz was, was mentioned about being misgendered? What is the bare minimum that we are required to understand to basically be not even activist allies, but to simply create a, a, a welcoming environment in our discipline? 
And I'll, I'll leave that with all of you to ponder um, and I'll pass it over to Helen to sort of wrap up. Great, thank you, Rich, and, and thank you, everybody. I, I've actually found this, this discussion this afternoon really, um, well, and this morning and middle of the night for Liz, um, really uh, enlightening because one of the things that I wrote down in, in my notes, well, actually when we started this session was that I, I, I want to advocate advocate for for everybody in the geosciences particularly those people who feel that you know they're underrepresented in some way or they feel that in some way they're being discriminated against because I've been on the wrong end of that myself I know how that feels but one of the things that I think we need to do is if we do need to encourage people to advocate for those for for, for others and we need to be kind to each other. I think Jane put it very well um, when she said um, we should be seeking rather to have microaggressions, to have micro kindnesses, if I remember your statement correctly, Jane. And I like that idea. I think that that is that is something I'd like to get put on the front of a T-shirt, actually. Um, but I think one of the most important things is we need to have confidence in our leadership. We need to have confidence in the fact that that they're taking this seriously, that, you know, they are recognizing that this is, this is an issue and it is an issue that we can't ignore, that we can't deal with, you know, as, as I think Chris said by, you know, quietly having a little conversation in a room. And, and, and I agree with Rich that, you know, too often, you know, HR policy is weaponized against the people it's supposed to support. Um, again, I've, I've seen too many examples of this. And I think EGU is in a unique position. And, and in fact, all scientific societies are in a unique position in that they can advocate for their members. We can make all of our members aware that, you know, that we're there, we're listening, and we want to know about the problems. But I want to go back to something that I think Rich put in the chat a little while ago, which was about we need to understand what we can do better and we can need to understand what EGU can do to really make a difference. Because I, I, I want people to tell me what, I have some ideas, but they're only from my perspective and they're only based on my very limited experience. But I want to know what others in the community think we should be doing, what we can do. And I know Rich, when we were preparing for this, this session, we talked about having um, a blog or something similar uh, that summarized what we discussed in this session that was almost a letter from the panelists, dear EGU, this is what we think you should be doing. And that then I would seek to write a response because I think what I want to do is start a proper conversation rather than just say going, OK, it's EGU this week. We're going to have a great debate on discrimination in the geosciences. We all go away and go, oh, yeah, that was pretty great. And that's it until next year. And we go, oh, yeah, maybe we should revisit that topic in a different shape. No, let's carry on the conversation. So, again, I'd like to know how we can carry on that conversation and what we can do to make a difference, because, as I've already said, one of the reasons I wanted to become president of EGU is because I want to do something about diversity, equality and inclusivity in the geosciences. And just listening to our three fantastic panelists today highlights why this matters so much. And lastly, I would say if you haven't watched Picture a Scientist while it's available, do. It even reduced my husband to tears and that is saying something. So I would like to just thank all of our panelists and also Rich, thank you for some fantastic moderation. Um, and thank you all very, very much for being part of this, this fantastic discussion this afternoon. Thank you.